Libby's Nimer on Zoomer Radio with guest host Jane Brown. It is Bladder Cancer Awareness Month. I've been an advocate for Bladder Cancer Canada since 2015 in memory of my mom who died with the disease in 2012. And joining me, uh, two gentlemen who have become friends over the years, Ferg Devins, bladder cancer survivor and chair of Bladder Cancer Canada, and Dr. Alexander Zlata, director of uro-oncology at Mount Sinai Hospital, professor in the Department of Surgery Urology at the University of Toronto and member of Bladder Cancer Canada's Medical Research Board. I'm looking forward to uh, them helping you out here with your questions. Let's go to Beverly in Hamilton. Beverly, go ahead. Hi. Um, it, last September, my husband was um, blood and insurance, and um, he was diagnosed with mild bladder cancer. But it was also the prostate, and it, um, so they did two TERPs and two BCGs. Um, by the time they were finished that, which was in March, um, it had gone into the um, muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, then... It, um, now it has gone into the uh, pelvic wall. Now I feel that there was too much time lapse between what they were doing. Now he does have Parkinson's, and he has atrial fibrillation. So, what is your question for the doctor, Beverly? Uh, it would he, should they be taking the bladder out when it's gone that far? They're going to do um, tests or uh, radiation and chemo. But I'm wondering, should they be taking that bladder out? Okay, Dr. Zlato, you've heard uh, Beverly's story. What are your thoughts? So, uh, I mean, and first of all, I'm, I'm really sorry uh, to hear that and, and, and uh, crossing fingers and toes uh, for the best response to the combination of chemo and RAS. What I can tell you is that, um, you know, when the disease is high grade but still not invasive, uh, the BCG is actually the standard of care. And so BCG is an immunotherapy. And it actually takes time for BCG to work because it really boosts the immune system to recognize tumor cells and to kill them. And you're absolutely right. The big dilemma uh, that many urologists face is that a substantial amount of patients will respond to BCG and therefore avoid the progression to muscle invasion. And this can be north of 75%. And that means that if you remove the bladder in those people, by definition, you over-treat. But at the same time, it happens, and that's really sad for sure, that people, despite the BCG, because it takes time, will invade and progress. And so it's a very, very difficult call. It's a, it's a call between, between overreacting and underreacting. The good news that I would like to share with you is that in the past, especially after 1BCG, when people did not respond to BCG, the only way to deal with that was to remove the bladder. But since probably two years, we have a truly flurry of new treatments which are effective. It can be from the combination of two drugs which are instilled in the bladder, like docetaxel and gemcitabine. It can be by using what is called the immune checkpoint inhibitors that were initially given for people who had the disease outside of the bladder, but where we realized that giving atezo, durvalumab, or nivolumab was able to actually maintain the disease confined to the bladder in a substantial number of patients. It can actually be with new compounds which are instilled in the bladder. Uh, one of them is astilidrin, uh, where it's actually a, a virus that will literally bring a bomb of interfering uh, alpha and then kill the cells. So as much as I, I, I really, really, genuinely sorry for what happened to, to your husband, I think that the future seems to be bright for many other patients. 
Beverly, thank you for calling. All the best to you and your husband. Thank you. Ferg, it's really encouraging to hear Dr. Zlata talk about all this great research. And I know that's a big part of what Bladder Cancer Canada does as well, is is helping to fund research with donations uh, from the annual walk. Yes, uh, our mandate is first and foremost to support our patient community, secondly, to raise awareness, and thirdly, to fund research. And, you know, we are so fortunate to have people such as Dr. Alex Zlata here in Canada, in Toronto, he's, he's world known in this field. And we're fortunate that we have many of our researchers and medical professionals across the country, Jane, who are such individuals in the space of urology and oncology. And what's fascinating is that we now share a world platform through the World uh, Bladder Cancer Patient Coalition, where we work around the world to really make a difference. And so... Funding research is critical. In in Canada this year, Bladder Cancer Canada, thanks to our donors, thanks to our supporters, thanks to those who support us during our walk, is putting forward $100,000 for research, and the Canadian Urological Association is matching that with oh, another 100000 Fantastic. So this year, we will have four $25,000 research grants and two $50,000 research grants to get out to our research community in Canada to continue the fine work that Dr. Zlada is pointing to and to continue to make breakthroughs in the fight against bladder cancer. Wow. Uh, a big smile on my face. Uh, that's great news. Great news to hear, Ferg. Let's go to Annette in Mount Forest. Annette, do you have a question for Dr. Zlata? Hi, Jane. Um, yeah, I'm a first-time caller, oh, and I had, my husband has bladder cancer since October 2018, and he's wondering about... Um, he's just finished the BCG treatment at the end of April, and on May 6th, he got his uh, Pfizer vaccine. Is there any... Um, problems with interactions between the two is ah. one going to nullify the other so two things first of all the uh, short answer is absolutely no interaction between the two absolutely none and so that's probably something uh, safe to to remember now it's even better than that bcg has been studied and actually we've been doing a study um here in in toronto where there has been some evidence that when people are vaccinated against tuberculosis with BCG, and that could also be the case when they receive intravesical BCG, although this is to be, um, to be proven, the BCG working as an immunotherapy literally stimulates part of you, your immunity, which call, is called train immunity. And what does that mean? It means that it teaches the, 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 the body to recognize um, viruses or other dangers which are completely unrelated to the BCG vaccine, but where the immune system is boosted to the point where you can fight off unrelated viruses, among them may be COVID. And so there's a lot of research to show that not only it has gotten zero interaction with the, the, the classical vaccines, but if anything, there is maybe a possibility that it would actually improve the immunity of people who got the, the BCG. And that well, is, good is that helpful? Good. Thank you. Yeah, that's great news. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you for calling. I think, uh, Dr. Zlata and Ferg, we have time for one more call, just a few minutes left here. Ron in Georgina. Ron, go ahead. Hello there. Yes, I, excuse me, I had my operation um, for two months ago, and now I've had my treatments for um, immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the next treatment after that? Dr. Zlata. So um, your disease was uh, a pussycat or something completely superficial, correct? No, I think he said it's, it's aggressive, but it's not, it's not in my muscle. It's not in the muscle. So normally for what's called a high-grade non-muscle invasive tumor, the way it works is that you receive your BCG six weekly installations, and then you're going to be monitored every three months with a cystoscopy for two years. And then every well, six got, months for yeah, I've I've got to go I've got to go in uh, June the second for my first uh, 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 look at me and test and I guess you'll know then exactly. And at the same time, um, studies have shown that 
giving only the BCG six weekly installations in aggressive disease is not enough. You really need, like many vaccines, boosting. And that's why, uh, in addition to the first six weekly installations, you will be advised by your urologist to have what's called maintenance BCG, which is given once a week for three weeks during three years. And usually it's every uh, six months. The first one is three months and then every six months. And so basically it's reboosting your immune system to recognize and kill the tumor cells. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ron. All the best to you with your therapy. Thank you. Bye. So as we uh, wrap up this segment for another year during Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, I'd just like to get final thoughts from both of our guests, Drs. Lada, Ferg, Devins. Uh, Ferg, we talked about, you know, the, the importance of if you see blood in your urine even once to reach out to your doctor. In terms of prevention, bladder cancer prevention, uh, lifestyle, all of that, what goes into trying to avoiding contracting bladder cancer? Well, we know risk factors, certainly smoking and other tobacco use is number one. Uh, we have information that past radiation exposure may be another uh, risk factor. Chronic bladder inflammation is another one. Possible exposure to chemicals, especially in the workplace, uh, could be another one. And then lastly, uh, parasitic infections. So I guess the one that we really caution people the most on is smoking. I was a smoker back in my youth, and that's probably why I have mm. bladder cancer. So, uh, you know, really smoking is probably the one that that raises most attention, I think, for for people. Dr. Zlata, final comments, uh, just some reassurance for people who may be going through bladder cancer diagnosis and treatment. So two things. One is that I fully agree with Ferg. I I think we'll have to be in the future a little bit uh, careful about pot smoking. A lot of people are now doing it. So it remains to be seen whether, you know, this is not eventually a risk factor to, to, be, to be monitored. I would err inside of caution. The, I'll, the final comment is that um, since now nine years that unfortunately your mom passed away, uh, we have seen the most incredible revolution that I would now never ever had dreamed when I started my career over th- three decades ago. And I think it's always not uh, fast enough, but there is such a flurry of new treatments to preserve the bladder, even when the disease went outside as does not respond to chemotherapy. There is such a, a, a breadth and, and, and wealth of, of competence in our country that I am actually pretty optimistic that every year uh, when we get together, I'll be able mm-hmm. to come up with even more reassuring news for people with the disease. That is where we will leave it uh, for this Bladder Cancer Awareness Month. And for any information on support from Bladder Cancer Canada, go to bladdercancercanada.org. Ferg and Dr. Zlata, thank you both so much. Wishing you well, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Be well. Always a pleasure. It is always a pleasure. Thank you both. Stay safe. Ferg Devins, bladder cancer survivor and chair of Bladder Cancer Canada, and Dr. Alexander Zlata, director of uroncology at Mount Sinai, professor in the Department of Surgery Urology at the University of Toronto, and member of Bladder Cancer Canada's Medical Research Board. Jane, for Libby, she will be back tomorrow. Have a great day. Fight Back with Libby Snymer is produced by Zeev Hadi. With technical production by Jordan Chakravarti and Jeremy Logan. Check out the Fight Back podcast anytime at zoomerradio.ca or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Zoomer Radio Toronto. CFZM FM and CFZM AM. Owned and operated by MZ Media Incorporated.